Um, I'm Roger Mosey, Master of Selwyn College, and you are very welcome to the latest in our series of online events for alumni and friends. And we're particularly pleased that this session is in association with the wider Cambridge Alumni Festival. So we greet people from colleges across Cambridge tonight uh, who are among hundreds of people zooming along with us. Now, um, it's rather a, a dark, actually, cool, damp evening in Cambridge. But there is a, a buzz starting to develop around the colleges because students are coming back and our communities uh, through the early years, early weeks of the um, health emergency uh, were very small indeed. But gradually, postgraduate students and now undergraduates are coming back here. And certainly so when we reckon we'll have about 150 undergraduates in residence before the end of the week. Um, and then, of course, um, hundreds more coming and the freshers arriving all in nine or ten days from now. And um, needless to say, we're taking every health precaution we can. And that includes a, a pioneering testing regime across Cambridge. So safety is very much our priority. But we are also determined that students will have as much of a college and university experience as we can possibly give them. And there will be no compromises at all on the excellence and the individual nature of our teaching. So we will keep you posted on all of that as we go through the academic year. But the reason we're here tonight is to hear from one of Cambridge's academics who's doing work of great importance as um, thousands more are across this city and with a demonstrable and immediate potential to change lives for the better. This is a talk about improving housing conditions and giving better health to some of the poorest people in the world, uh, while also using energy more efficiently and taking seriously the challenges of the global south and indeed the future of the entire planet. Um, in the time she's been a fellow at Selwyn, I have been incredibly impressed by Dr. Renita Barden because her work is so wide ranging and also because she brings architecture more strongly into the college portfolio as well as introducing fresh thinking into the university, where she is a university lecturer of sustainability in the built environment. Now, Renita is going to speak for about 30 minutes or so. Afterwards, there will be a question and answer session. So please send in your questions via the chat function, um, which you can do throughout the talk, and we'll collate them at the end. But now, um, let me hand over to Dr. Renita Barden. Renita. Thank you so much, Roger, for this wonderful uh, description of myself. I'm sorry, I, uh, yeah, uh, I dropped my mouse. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Roger, for uh, this wonderful introduction. I will quickly uh, start sharing uh, my presentation while I speak uh, about my work. Please bear with me. So uh, a very big welcome to all of you who have uh, had taken out the time to join this uh, Digital Alumni uh, Festival. Hard times do call for hard measures and we are going digital this time. Probably uh, the positives is a lot more people are able to join this uh, festival together. So today I would talk a little bit about my, uh, and briefly try to cover a lot of uh, what I have been doing for quite some time now in my research field and what sort of impact that it has been bringing uh, to the larger section of the population, especially in the global south. So my title uh, of the talk is Housing to Decouple the Energy and Health Burden from Poverty. Broadly, my research domain uh, kind of transverses across these four uh, social um, sustainable development goals, what is, is of health and well-being, energy efficiency, uh, gender equality, and then uh, housing and communities, so sustainable housing and communities, which is SDG 11. A larger uh, part of my work is um, uh, kind of sur surrounded around the sustainable design being for uh, quality of life, and that's why my group is, or research group is called Sustainable Design Group. And you can go a bit of details, you can scan and go to the web page of my research. So broadly, I work on these tripartite of these health and well-being, gender equality, and energy, and all of them kind of come together uh, through design of the housing. So I'll broadly be talking about residentials here, because I have been working on housing, housing itself. So as a case, um, 
when I talk about Global South, one of the most prominent country we uh, comes across is India. And because of its unprecedented growth that it has been witnessing uh, over the past few decades, and probably we will, uh, we will witness India being the most populated uh, in probably near future of 2030, 2040. And uh, currently, if you see um, almost by, we will see that in India, almost 55% of global uh, of the population will be living in urban areas, and that would also contribute to the large proportion of the GDP that India would be contributing. In this uh, arena of this um, unprecedented growth that India has been uh, following, it has now to meet a lot of urgent needs in terms of housing, in terms of energy, in terms of city development planning, and also in terms of health. So they have these four major pillar, or I would say, um, policies that have been uh, coming into action. And if you see the dates, uh, 2020, 2022, these are like kind of the deadlines of achieving the targets of these kind of policies. So today I'll talk about these four policies. One is LPG for all, that is every household should have very clean cooking fuel. And because that has a lot of um, knockoff effects on the health. So LPG for all is one of the top primary target. Housing for all, that means almost all houses or, or everybody living in India should be entitled to one house. So it's, uh, so that's kind of the policy um, um, kind of wants to attain. It also attain, want to attain very uh, futuristic cities and smart cities in the meantime, while attaining these LPG for all and very basic needs. And finally, all of these culminate into bringing into health. So currently, if you see almost um, most of these targets are being fulfilled and uh, if uh, one of the target that is TB free India, that is tuberculosis free India, which has to be uh, by 2025, it's uh, alarming because India still witnesses al almost 1500 uh, deaths per day uh, due to tuberculosis. I'll take the case of Mumbai and Maharashtra, the state uh, for which Mumbai is the capital, and start talking about a little bit about how housing, how health, how energy are all correlated to each other. Uh, in order to um, talk about Mumbai, if you see the Mumbai is located in the western part of India, and uh, that's where uh, that's where you will find uh, on your left hand side you will find uh, a picture of Mumbai, an aerial view of Mumbai, and if you see uh, near these areas, I'll try to uh, point out if you can near these areas where you see small small blue kind of uh, uh, sort of a hutments. These are the slum areas of Mumbai and unprecedentedly almost 50% or more than 50% of Mumbai's populations lives in slum or slum-like conditions. Given this sort of a background of Mumbai, if you zoom into what sort of indoor air quality these sort of houses, not only those sort of houses, but across the residential sector India is currently facing, a large section of population still uses the most dirtiest fuel for cooking. Cleaner fuels comes uh, in a very small percentage and that's why LPG for all becomes a very important policy uh, to achieve uh, by, by the, uh, to achieve the targets. And if you see why that is more important, the more dirty the fuel is, that will create a lot of burden of disease. And currently in India itself, it accounts for around two thirds of uh, um, a burden of disease is accountable to household indoor air pollution, especially coming from cooking due to dirty fuels. And this is a picture that you will see very common in almost all Indian homes, especially in rural areas, urban areas are transiting, but uh, the urban poor are probably a mix of this along with some cleaner fuels or semi cleaner fuels like kerosene. So we uh, uh, started, our lab started working on uh, starting from rural areas and then I will start zooming into the, uh, what's the scenario in urban areas. And if we went to a village which was uh, pretty affluent, that is they were not poor, they, did, they were cash rich population. So you can see on your right hand side, uh, people who are cooking and on your left hand side, you can see images of uh, the, how the house looks like. So, the how the house looks like from outside is much different from how the house or the kitchen where the woman and the children pref possibly spends 90% of her, her time uh, for cooking spends in these dark, 
kind of a corridor sort of an enclosed uh, spaces which almost one window and the window itself is never open because of various reasons not just because they want to drive away the pollution and the what they call smoke of the cooking but also there are privacy issues there are insects there are animals who come in so they have to they kind of never almost open the window which you see here so what we did was we wanted to understand what's a kitchen like how does a woman cook in a kitchen and why is uh, the global burden of disease uh, which is accountable uh, to india at a such a larger extent because of the fuel can we improve the kitchen uh, so that we can uh, drive away the pollution uh, faster because transiting to a cleaner fuel itself is a very big challenge uh, for a poorer economy and also it's also a cultural blockage because for years people have been cooking in this sort of environment so women demanding to cook in a cleaner fuel is uh, probably will be un not heard as seriously as it should be so these were the variety of kitchens that we saw and then we started modeling the air in the kitchen and if you see the uh, word that age of air is almost similar like uh, amount of time the air stays within before it get refreshed from the opening that is available so it's a window or a door and we found out that on an average the kitchens have an have a, an age of air of 3.5 minutes that means the pollution will stay or the pollution that is generated from dirty fuel cooking will stay for a much longer time and given this that the woman is almost spending 90% of her time in the kitchen does account that she will be exposed to a very large amount of uh, indoor air pollution from cooking so we what we did, decided was can we change the design in such a fashion that we reduce the age of air to the extent possible and we could reduce the age of air to a very larger extent to uh, so previously we would see around 3 minutes and now it could be reduced with us with just a design intervention and some sort of and without changing their cooking practice because if we do not create these invisible infrastructure probably demanding for uh, or requiring for a person to change their behavior would be very very difficult so we were unable through use of design through use of technology we were able to reduce this to 35 seconds uh, as a case study but on an average it was quite lower and the air refreshed quite faster similar conditions when we look at urban india especially when i take the economic capital of mumbai as a case and you see this image is a very typical image of mumbai and you will see this whenever you fly over mumbai and all of these houses use a mix of fuel typically dirty fuel and also uh, some houses are also using a liquid liquid petroleum gas uh, so they are also using a mix of clean and dirty fuels so what is happening in order to um, get a lot of uh, land which is being occupied by these sort of slums or which we call informal settlements in mumbai the government of mumbai has come across uh, with a fantastic plan uh, to kind of remove these slums and then convert them into um, proper housing so at a single go what they are trying to do is they're going to give proper tenancy to these people so each of the slum dweller will get a house for free and the rest of the land that is being created would actually be used for closing the rest of the housing deficit so you will across the city you will see like the slums being replaced by these vertical towers where um, where the so if you see this image this is a slum clear up area has been cleared and you will see a, a type of housing in front of a, a la large housing so this is the slum rehabilitation housing that is being built people has not yet moved in this is the prefabricated transit accommodation where the slum dwellers are currently living and this is a new typology of housing which is high end and would actually close the other sector of the housing deficit so this is sort of a argument that is coming up that they are not moved away from the place because most of the slum dwellers don't like to get rehabilitated because they are given houses outside the city where they are out of jobs so in this fantastic policy what is happening is they are getting houses for free tenement houses that means they have uh, they hold the right to the housing that means almost owning an apartment and also they are not moved away from uh, their spatial association to the space is not uh, disconnected so we were, we were very interested to see what happens when people actually move from the slums to these resettlement colonies or these vertical towers 
typically if you see if you kind of uh, drive through these spaces it almost looks like uh, vertical towers uh, one after the other where each of these units which each of these uh, households or the slum dwellers will get each household will get a 30 25 to 30 square meter of unit a multi purpose space with a toilet attached so it's a room where you will on an average you will find five to six population per persons living so that's the average household size of these sort of uh, uh, these slum dwellers so we wanted to see what's happening in these houses are they better because they are called rehab slum rehabilitation housing so if if something they are being given uh, in place of, a, of and in the promise of a better life the houses should also perform as effectively as the promises so we this is how a particular typical uh, house would look like so if you walk in uh, from this area this is the door area you will see a bed and you will see a kitchen corner and there will be a toilet uh, here so we wanted to see what's happening uh, in the airflow of and we did find out some uh, some things that we didn't expect so the air velocities were very low and that we kind of wanted to see as a reflection in their health uh, visits to the doctor and the they said after they moved from the slums to the slum rehabilitation units, the number of health visits or the frequency of health visits has increased like almost three folds. And the causes for each of these health visits are uh, ranging from feeling tired or breathlessness or also feeling uh, or cough and cold or some kind of respiratory or cardiovascular uh, ailment. So we wanted to see where this is more concentrated is it on the ground floor is it on the first floor or is it on the higher floors and evidently the ground floor performed the worst in terms of uh, in terms of the age of air or what we would call the staleness of the air and the frequency obviously of visits were also correlated to that so we wanted to see what's happened happening uh, when we did this sort of an exercise we wanted to actually go into these houses and do an experimental campaign to actually measure what sort of pollution concentrations these sort of houses are facing in comparison to when they were living in the slums and that would they gave us so we chose two how uh, two of these slum rehabilitation colonies and one colony was the was basically dharavi which is the largest slum one of the largest slum in asia which which has around a density of 200000 persons per square kilometer which is a huge uh, in terms of density also it has it is all it also contributes a large amount to the mumbai's as well as india's gdp so it cannot be kind of immediately replaced so it, it is also very important in terms of policy uh, framework for a city so if you see a typical uh, rehabilitation or slum rehabilitation housing you will find that each of these houses are like a living room a toilet a kitchen alcove or you'll have a different design of something sort of this a kitchen alcove and a toilet adjacent so we installed our sensors which would measure temperature pressure relative humidity and also uh, it would measure the total pollution concentration typically particulate matter which is which our lungs cannot filter a human lung, lung cannot filter which is below uh, 2.5 so anything which will so we measured across the spectrum of particulate matter and we did we were more concerned about the particulate matter which was less than 2.5 uh, so if you see visually the slum versus the slum rehabilitation housing you will find that uh, the slum rehabilitation housing has less access to the ground space the window behavior if you see most of the windows are blocked so there's only one window in each of the unit and most of the time that is blocked and if that is to be done what is happening to the pollution concentration so we wanted to compare versus the slum versus the rehabilitation and evidently the slum the rehabilitation houses did not perform well if not worse actually people living in the slums had lesser concentration of pollution because most of their time whatever other than just cooking also they are spending a lot of time outdoors they're doing a lot of outdoor activities here indoor they are uh, burning incense sticks all the sources of pollution are indoors that there's no activity that is happening outdoor and hence the concentration is also adding up to study the plume uh, where should the kitchen be and we found out the typically whether actually the kitchen is the plume directly comes across to the multipurpose area and they are uh, they get the highest amount of concentration so probably living in these houses might lead to more uh, kind of a, a burden of disease from uh, particulate matter 
rather than living in the slums. Given that we wanted to see what sort of interventions are possible, so we actually found out just by changing the design, we could actually reduce it up to 93%, 94%. And just by investing a little bit like an exhaust fan, we, they could reduce it up to 98% of the pollution levels. And just by spending a very little money, so you don't have to spend a lot or to get this sort of a benefit or advantage. If you zoom in more, we wanted to check what's happening in terms of case of tuberculosis. So we chose three different designs of the same rehabilitation housing. So we call a cross type, a double loaded type and a single loaded corridor type. And we saw across the daylight, the ventilation and the tuberculosis rate. Effectively, anybody who is looking at this image would say which house actually performed the worst. Definitely the single loaded corridor performed the worst because almost each of the units were not receiving any amount of ventilation that is possible. These houses do not have the uh, opportunity to install an uh, active ventilation system that is an energy intensive ventilation system. So all, most of the ventilation is natural ventilation. Wanted to understand what's the discomfort from the uh, daylight that is happening most of the time uh, you would find uh, uh, complaints like my eyesight is poor, I cannot see anymore. They cannot open the curtains, their uh, lux levels are fairly low. So we need at least 300 lux, which is around this, to perform minimum daily activities. Most of the, with lights on and even off, you would find uh, most of the time it is below 100, 100 lux. And sometimes it can go around 150 lux, which is like very poor and can strain and fatigue the eye a lot. So a policy, which is, so it, the first question comes, what sort of policy is this, uh, where the slum dweller gets a housing for free? So this policy is a fantastic uh, hallmark policy uh, in terms of participatory approach. So the developer uh, doesn't decide that we want to develop a particular slum into a slum rehabilitation. The government doesn't decide. The people who live in the slum, they decide whether they want to go in for rehabilitation. And that's the incentive is they get a house for free. Most of the people living in the slums, they do not have tenureship to their houses. So when they get, sign up for this, the first thing that they get, they start owning a house in the fantastic city or the maximum city of Mumbai. And we wanted to see if a policy, which is such a bottom-up approach, which is such a hallmark policy uh, in terms of participatory approach, what, what is the sentiment like? Because in order to have a positive impact, the sentiments that is, is it a positive sentiment that the people living in, in these sort of uh, housing have positive or negative? And very drastically, you will see the females have a very mixed with a very positive feeling because this is for the probably for the first time they have a toilet inside their house. So they don't have to control their food intake during the night in order to restrict themselves from visiting the toilet at the night. Whereas the policymakers, you will see there's a lot of negative sentiments because they are worried that people might sell off these and go away. And they are not at all concerned about what is actual concerns of the people living there. And that makes a little bit uh, a disconnect because policymakers have a myopic vision of uh, maximizing number of units or maximizing number of people they can accommodate in these sort of houses. And that's, that's, that's how you close a housing deficit. But then there, there are other, uh, other things which in housing also kind of uh, impacts, the impacts on the energy performance, it impacts on the health. And that's probably is, is the ministry of, for a different sort of a ministry. So housing ministry doesn't actually look into that. So probably policymakers are not aware of these sort of uh, implications that their housing is actually causing. We started talking about mental health. Generally, they are very happy and satisfied because for the first time they own a house in Mumbai. They appreciated uh, that they have gone in for this some rehabilitation housing, but they don't know the perils that are awaiting them. So most of the time when we start ask them, do you feel lonely at this? Because their complete social network, which you, these informal open spaces in the slums used to provide is completely broken now because there's absolutely no space where they can go and mix. There's no open space provided to them. They feel a lot of sad. There's a lot of anxiety. Women have, uh, most of the time they have told us that they don't trust their neighbors with their children. Uh, so they don't leave their children and they cannot. So the women face a large amount of time poverty in this uh, circumstances. There's also a little bit of anger because a lot of things are not being met, which were promised. 
So that's, that's kind of a general uh, policy outcome, I would say, for any kind of policy. So how do we kind of translate? So I started looking during the COVID times, these, these places become, became the hotspots. And evidently, they will become because it doesn't allow that kind of uh, built environment uh, standard that is required for healthy living. So in UK terms, we I started uh, looking at and we did find out the maximum amount of deaths that were happening were in which were the most poorer communities or the most poorer social housing communities. And a lot of, a lot of uh, talk was around that how bad housing kills and how poor housing was linked to very high COVID-19 death rate in London borough. In global terms, the United Nations Habitat has uh, kind of said that housing is both a prevention and cure for COVID if you see from the lens of COVID, but I would try to make it at a broader spectrum and say if you see it from the lens of the health perception, typically respiratory disease, which is more plagued into uh, the woman population rather than and the children child population. In global terms, it's also United Nations Human Rights has said that housing is the frontline defense against COVID outbreak and emerging evidence on COVID-19's impact on health is actually related to housing inequalities and related to housing. And thank you so much. And I would like to, uh, these are my acknowledgements. I've been working across uh, the globe with a lot of collaborations and they have made this sort of study a possibility. Thank you so much. I'll now stop sharing my slides. Uh, Renita, huge thanks for that. And um, as I've said before, the frustration of these events is that you can't hear the applause ringing round all our alumni and friends, but I'm sure it would be there if we were if we were able to um, hear it. And certainly quite a lot of questions coming in and quite a lot of people um, um, sending applause as well. So um, please do send your questions via the chat yes. function. Um, I will now put some of those to Ronita and um, keep them coming. So um, a question from John Ryan. Um, how well do elderly occupants enjoy living in tower blocks when they eventually get there? So uh, this is very uh, interesting because we also wanted to look at that. Because, and in India, uh, there's, there's this joint family system. So a typical household will definitely consist of what, either both of the elderly or one of the elderly. So the most sufferers, I think, are elderly population because I'll quote from one of the narratives of the interviews that we got. There's one lady who lives, uh, who's, who lives along with her son and the son goes out to work during the day. And throughout the day, she lives at the eighth floor. So she's at the topmost floor, probably getting the best view of Mumbai. I don't know what view she gets. But she, because, of, because the lifts start, stop working at certain times of the day, she can't mix with other people. And so loneliness was mostly reported by this sort of population. And so what she does is she actually comes down and sits uh, at the ground floor uh, patio level. But the problem is if she is spending so much time at the ground floor level, she ha does not have access to a toilet. She does not have access to proper food throughout the day in a proper time. So every time she can't climb up like to the eighth floor and get her food and get herself relieved, her, relieve herself. So this is a basic problem that you would say. So when you enter these sort of houses, which we have done during our experimental campaign, you will find a lot of people, a lot of old elderly people spending a lot of time on the ground floor. And that, that's, that's a good view to see at a snapshot. Probably it has a lot of other implications. I mean, I mean, that relates actually to a question from Anne Brumfit, who said, what about lift access to higher stories, or does it mean incarceration? And she also asked a question about what the play opportunities are for obviously younger people in, in high rise. So that, that sounds like a real problem. Yeah, it does. Because if you see um, the whole um, plan, in uh, plan and in, in in paper, they, they, these houses have like, these, there's a, these houses are surrounded by a, kind of a very large, uh, New York Central Park type of green space. So it's in, in paper, it's a, a broad green rectangle. And when you go there, you will see these spaces are actually encroached by illegal parking. These spaces are encroached by a lot of other kind of um, illegal activities, I would say, or unwanted activities. So women cannot send their children outside to play because there are a lot of drug abuse that is also happening in these spaces. There are a couple of questions which are about the sort of terms on which this accommodation is is arranged yeah. so um david patey do the inhabitants of the new sun replacement housing have any equity in the new dwelling or other ability to leverage their stake yes 
So what happens? So each of these buildings that you saw, uh, those tower blocks, each of these buildings, they form a cooperative system. And so they kind of uh, pool in some money uh, each month to maintain their uh, electricity bills for the common spaces, for the lift operation, etc. But you have to understand these areas are also uh, poverty stricken. So people actually steal parts of the elevator and lifts and then they sell it off in the market. So lifts needs a very regular or high level of maintenance. And that's where I uh, particularly find it's very difficult because um, now the economic burden is quite high on these. So the equity terms is that they do form a cooperative and these cooperatives then go ahead uh, and then they kind of uh, tell, the, tell the problems of the, to the higher authorities or the policymakers. I mean, that's related to a question from Caroline Field who says, um, people get a flat for free, but what happens about a service charge to keep the building yeah. running? Can some people not afford this? And is that the problem with lifts? So that's, you touched the, on that in the previous Kind answer. of, yes, yes. Okay, um, there, there, there are some um, questions about health, which are obviously um, crucially important as well. Um, yes. uh, Jonathan Lancaster, um, uh, who thanks you for the engaging topic. It was mentioned that the frequency of health visits increased after relocation. Do you yes. believe there's to be a causal link between directly related to indoors air quality or is rehabilitation also associated with increased access to health services? Um, yes, so we also wanted, so this is um, a little bit of, yes, access to health services. I wouldn't say have increased a lot because each of the slum has their own sort of a primary health care center within a 500 meter of range. So it's not that they are far away from any kind of access to health care when they're living in the slums. So this whole notion that they, are, they, are, they have higher access to health care facilities and that's why they are going uh, is, uh, is a misnomer in this case, actually. Moreover, when we studied the health um, care be seeking behavior, we found that do, in India, typically most prevalent is do nothing. Until and a person feels that the person is going to die, the person will not visit a doctor. So the whole system of access actually kind of doesn't work in this. It's more of they are falling sick much more often. And they have reported that from their bills. So they don't want their, so in India, healthcare is not free. So everybody is, has to spend out of pocket for every healthcare visit that they are uh, seeking behavior that they are doing. So uh, it, they want to reduce that charge. So that has increased almost three folds. Um, two questions about the um, economics of building the flats. So uh, Fiona Morrison, who's a Sewan alumna, she asked a very simple question, where has the money come from to build the flats? And then Chuks Ebay has says, is, how is the funding for a program like this, like this sourced since it's given out for free? The question is because my organization is working on urban slum reduction here in Nigeria but investors are scared of getting a return on their investment. Yeah, so uh, if, if you can re, um, kind of recall the image of three tall buildings, which I showed, one was very good and savvy and it was under construction. One was the transit accommodation. So what happens when a slum uh, community goes to a developer and says, we want our slum community to be developed into a rehabilitation colony. The developer's incentive is whatever the land that is remains after clearing, after building these slum re redevelopment houses or some rehabilitation houses, the rest of the land the developer gets is for free. He doesn't pay a penny to the government to build any amount of so houses on that free land that is that the developer has cleared. His only obligation is to build these sort of rehabilitation units. So what happens, the developer actually sells the rest part of the land at very high real estate speculated market and very high prices. These are very high end houses, which has a big wall. And then you have the, have a sort of a green barrier sort of a thing. And then you have the slum rehabilitation housing. So it's a very different question again uh, on the social front. How does it look like in the urban fabric of Mumbai? But this is how it's happening. So it's a win-win because a slum dweller doesn't want to go away from that space and gets a house for free. The developer doesn't spend a penny to get a, get a clean slate of land for building very high-end residential market. And the government benefits because the, now the government is no longer paying compensations and no longer intervening in clearing one land or the other land. The government is just facilitating and seeing whether this whole process is done in a perfect manner. 
A uh, couple of questions about um, air quality and pollution. Um, blunt and simple question from John Clegg. Did the policymakers not think about air pollution when designing the units? I, I have asked them and they said they follow, or typically I have, I have, uh, we, uh, from our project, we have actually interviewed a large list of architects and developers who actually design these houses. And so there is a specific uh, guidelines or recommendatory and statutory guidelines for slum rehabilitation units which is very interesting because it only specifies the minimum requirements and the minimum and when you give it to a developer who wants the maximized land the developer would definitely follow the minimum requirements so the minimum requirements definitely do not allow any form of natural ventilation because the distance between the buildings which are eight story high is around 3 to 4 meters which is, which itself just by looking at it would probably look like a slum from a sky, from a bird's eye view image. Okay, and um, a question from Alice Martin, um, also around air quality, but I'm wondering what impact moving to LPG cooking fuel would have on the air quality in the slum housing. Would it improve enough to improve health or are other measures also needed? So all of these people who have moved into these houses had LPG. So we have actually interviewed more than 4,500 uh, households in these uh, housing uh, uh, rehabilitation houses. All of them had LPG, but they also had other fuels stored. So what they typically do is they use the LPG because even after subsidy, LPG is quite costly for them. So they will use it for preparing shorter meals, but they for preparing the meals which take a longer time, they would use probably kerosene or some other forms of fuel. We haven't seen a coal or firewood being used in these houses. So that sort of pollution is now kind of gone. But there are other things like in India, there's a, there's a menace of mosquitoes. So there's mosquito repellent coils. The, the cultural um, aspects of it where uh, praying is associated with burning incense sticks that itself also contrib contributes to a large amount of pol indoor pollution. Apart from indoor smoking, apart from other kind of activities that do release a lot of uh, particulate matter. So the pollution concentrations were, uh, if I have to give a number to it, World Health Organization says in the kitchen for a country like India, the value should be around 50 to 60. Whereas in these houses we have recorded during cooking it is around 2000 with windows closed because typically they keep their windows closed because it opens up to a uh, public thoroughfare corridor. And uh, after cooking, it can go as low as 800 to 500. So that's also way, way like 10 times higher than the recommended levels. Okay, we've got less than um, 10 minutes left. So keep, keep sending your questions in. Again, I'm gonna put two together because these are about the sort of big issue, I guess, from. Um, Dion Burgess who says, as a geography teacher, this is absolutely fascinating. With a large percentage of the population living in slums, are redevelopment houses possible and preferable for all? And that, I think, goes with Joseph May, who says there are obviously various schemes. Do you think with good design and implementation, such a scheme can ever be genuinely good for the inhabitants? Or do you think they're doomed to be unhealthy, inequitable, inhospitable? That's, that's a very, I think that's a very tough question, especially the second one where we are talking about justice and equity. And I won't go, but if for a person where, who are moving into, into an urban area, typically in search of a better life, which is to be, which India is currently uh, facing, uh, slum is the first stop that they get, they get an kind of a, to reside on. So if the first stop becomes a rehabilitation housing, at least a permanent tenureship, they does, the person doesn't have to be anxious that the person can be evicted any day because of some kind of infrastructural work or somebody can just take the house away because the person doesn't own it. So this uh, sort of a housing uh, program has actually closed those sort of anxieties for any kind of urban poors who are living in these areas. Whereas if I, if I have to see uh, that this sort of housing is unsuccessful, no, this uh, this has actually closed a large amount of housing deficit, which India was. India had around 30% of housing deficit for quite a long time. And it has been able to close a very significant amount of housing deficit and people are not selling it off. Because typically previous uh, slum redevelopment projects, which were housed outside the city, um, city in the suburbs, 
the slum dwellers used to get it and then they sell it off because they, they don't afford to live there because if, if they have to live there, they have to commute two and a half hours to the city to do their jobs. So that, this is for the first time they're not selling it off. Uh, so there's, there's also a cap, like you cannot sell it off till a certain time, num, uh, amount of years. And uh, the tenureship is actually on leasehold. So it's around 99 years. It, it actually changes from scheme to scheme. But uh, because the lease is on the name of the woman of the household, the selling uh, tendency has gone down. If I have to say that whether the, on a longer run, if better designed, these houses will actually prove to be better. Yes, I do believe that uh, very strongly because uh, most of these people have not uh, uh, switched to different forms of thermal comfort from energy intensive devices. They still have the habit or the cultural practice of getting thermally comfortable uh, with natural ventilation. So there's a huge potential to reduce the energy burden that India might face with an unprecedented growth. That housing can actually decouple that. And uh, if done right, if well designed, probably the health factor would also be reduced quite significantly because we, I showed you, but just by doing design interventions, we could theoretically reduce the pollution levels by 98%. And that's significant. Okay, um, two more questions. What, one um, from Reinhard Skinner, really broadening it out um, in a global sense. Um, what's different about the Dharavi resettlement tower blocks compared with the failed high-rise solutions tried in slum improvements in other cities in Asia and elsewhere? For example, location in the old slum area seems to be one big positive difference and yes. the destruction of social networks seems not to be any better. Yes. So uh, if you remember, I showed you three different designs. One was double loaded corridor, one was a single loaded corridor, and one was the cross design. So we wanted to see whether design does have impact on the access to open space. The cross design was fantastic because first of all, it allowed two windows per households, which was not possible in the other two designs. So automatically you are catering for cross ventilation there. Secondly, it was very intelligently designed because they had open spaces at grade. So uh, if you go on the first floor, there was an open space, a little bit of open space where the, uh, the apartment unit people, they could come there, gather. So they really don't have to go out uh, and go downstairs and have the access to that. So the access to the ground is kind of compensated with these open spaces at various levels. And I don't know whether there's a correlation or not or a causation or not. We found women to be less time poor in these in the cross design than in the other two designs. We also found women entered into formal job markets being nurses and kindergarten school teachers, whereas women in the other two designs, where which was more, more of a linear sort of a fashion with double loaded corridor, they were actually in the informal market when they were in the uh, in Dharavi or in the other slums. But when they moved here, they were so much pressed with time to maintain their regular activities and their familial activities and even childcare activities that they actually went out of the whole labor force. So most of the people, uh, women in these sort of uh, linear design were actually not working. Whereas in contrast to the cross design, I, we don't know whether they, it's a causality or is it, is it because now th that they can actually let the children out while they use that time to develop some kind of vocational training or something like that. But they, there are a lot number of women who are nurses and who are uh, kindergarten teachers. Final question, Renita. Right? I gave you a big build up saying the work you're doing does change the world and help people's lives be better. So someone's asked the question, can my organization work with your college and I guess the wider university Absolutely. to develop a workable plan and we'll be glad to work with you. So how can people contact you or collaborate? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I, I can actually leave my um, uh, contact details uh, with Roger or and you can uh, circulate. But uh, I, I think it would be much better if you can have a sort of a research center or a kind of a, a center which actually looks at housing as a design to decouple and help. So if you can house it at Selwyn, if you can have some fellowships, that would be perfect to kind of do this sort of a research in Selwyn itself. Uh, and we'd certainly be very glad to talk about that because it, it yeah. is 
very, very important work. And I, I know, judging by the number of questions, and I do apologise for people I haven't been able to um, include because we've had so many questions, but um, uh, Renita, all I can do is thank you hugely again and wish you all the best with your work. And I think it's one of the things that we all find inspiring that our university uh, is, is working on these kind of practical issues um, which do um, are of enormous importance to all of us. So thank you for your work and thank you very much for the talk tonight. And um, I can see lots of people saying that. So great session says uh, one, fantastic work. Thank you for a great talk. Um, and lots of people coming in with similar views. Um, can I just say to everybody, um, the Alumni Festival continues for uh, two, three more days. So do take part in plenty of other sessions. If you are from Selwyn, you can grill me, the senior tutor and the uh, vice master on Saturday afternoon. And we have commemoration of benefactors online as well on uh, Saturday at 6 p.m. Um, but meantime, thank you to all hundreds of people who joined us tonight. I see Kirsten Land saying thank you. Fascinating. John Lyon, terrific. Uh, Dion Burgess, brilliant. Thank you. Will a replay be available? Good question. Uh, we will put this online, yes. And um, uh, again, thanks, Renita. Thanks, everybody, for being with us. And um, uh, stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Roger. It was fantastic sharing my work with such a big audience. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Bye, everybody. Bye.